on August 19, 1997, having just shot several people and robbed them of $170,000. Mr. White sat calmly on a Ferris wheel at an amusement park and watched as police shut down the entire city to hunt him down. This true story is about one of China's most notorious robbers. Welcome to Red Eastern True Crime. If you enjoy this story, please subscribe to my channel. Let's dive into this story. The man in the story is one of the most brutal criminals in the history of Chinese law enforcement. He has killed 17 people and injured 22. In 2002, a 26 episode TV series based on his story was broadcast nationwide in China, bringing more attention to his story. While condemning the brutality of this criminal, it also led to a surprising turn of events. He became an admired figure to many. His name is Bai Baoshan. Bai means white, so we call him Mr. White. Mr. White was born in November 1958 in Beijing during the Great Famine, a difficult period in China often referred to as the Three Years of Difficulty, or the Three Years of Natural Disasters. Both of White's parents worked for Capital Steel Company in Beijing. When he was two years old, his father died. And due to the difficult living conditions, his mother sent him back to her hometown in Sushui District, Baoding City, Hebei Province, to be cared for by his grandparents. Later, his mother remarried. In 1971, at the age of 13, White returned to Beijing and enrolled in the first grade of primary school. Because he was much older than his classmates, he often faced ridicule, which deeply wounded his already sensitive and insecure inner self. He attended school for only two years before dropping out to work. At the age of 18, White was hired as a dock worker at Beijing Electrical Carbon Factory. During his time at the factory, he attended a military civilian live fire training course, which sparked his fascination with firearms. After work, he would take a borrowed pellet gun into the nearby woods to hunt birds. White was a quiet and reserved person who didn't have many friends, but he was very dedicated to his hobbies and enjoyed honing his shooting skills through extensive training. In 1981, at the age of 23, he married a woman from the same factory where he worked and the following year they had twins, a boy, and a girl. Financial pressures increased after the children were born, and urged on by others, White turned to theft. Between December 1982 and January 1983, he and others stole various items, including clothes, a bicycle, an old jacket, a mosquito net, an automatic umbrella, high-heeled shoes, and a woman's watch, totaling 620 RMB about $315. Two months later, on March 8th, he was arrested by police and soon sentenced to four years in prison. White's four-year sentence for theft was considered severe because it occurred during China's strike-hard anti-crime campaign in 1983, which was a three-year anti-crime campaign. Before this, China had experienced economic stagnation due to a series of events including the Great Leap Forward, the Great Famine, the Cultural Revolution, and the Down to the Countryside Movement. In 1980, the government ended a 25-year program that had sent urban youth to the rural areas, resulting in a flood of unemployed youth returning to the cities and exacerbating the already chaotic public order. During the 1983 anti-crime campaign, cases were handled quickly and harshly, resulting in some highly controversial and wrongful convictions such as a woman sentenced to death for having sexual relations with several men while unmarried, and a well-known actor sentenced to four years in prison for having intimate activities with a female friend at home, resulting in the interruption of his acting career. While in prison, White told a fellow inmate about some other crimes he had committed. The inmate, who was seeking a reduced sentence, then revealed that White had stolen a bag of corn and after being caught, grabbed a stick and hit the victim on the head, causing a bad injury. In addition, White had also stolen bicycle tires, televisions, and parts from the warehouse. As a result, he received a 10-year sentence, which was added to his previous sentence for a total of 14 years. 
His scheduled release date was March 7, 1997. This additional sentence had a major impact on White, causing him to become very suspicious of others. His wife divorced him and shortly thereafter remarried, taking their children with her. This left White with a lot of anger and resentment towards society. He once told his cellmate that he thought the sentence was extremely unfair, and if it went beyond 20 years, he planned to take revenge by harming others when he got out. In 1991, after serving eight years in a Beijing prison, White had his Beijing ID card revoked and was sent to Shihezi Xinan Prison in Xinjiang. As a frontier province of China, Xinjiang attracted many fugitives in the 1980s and 1990s, and the government often transferred criminals from other provinces to Xinjiang for labor reform. The prison where White was held was located in the Gobi Desert, with a desert to the north and barren grassland surrounding the high walls. On the south side was a row of cattle pens, with no other buildings nearby. The prisoners had a daily routine of reporting in the morning, and then being escorted by guards to work outside after breakfast. They worked until evening, then were brought back inside for dinner and sleep. This was the routine for ordinary prisoners. There was also a special type of prisoner, called a free prisoner, who was responsible for gardening or herding. To become a free prisoner, two conditions had to be met. First, the sentence had to be more than half completed, and the prisoner had to be on good behavior. Second, a deposit of 10,000 RMB, about $1,200, had to be paid to the prison. Although it was easy for free prisoners to escape, they usually didn't because of the deposit, and the fact that if they were caught, they would face a heavier sentence, which made it not worth it. After writing a letter to his mother asking for help, White's family raised the money to help him become a free prisoner. As a result, White moved from the prison to a house near the cattle pens outside the prison. His job was to care for and herd the cows, and he also received a share of the profits from the sale of the milk. During his time in prison, White made two friends. One was Li Qingliang, who had been imprisoned for a revenge killing and was very knowledgeable about firearms from his previous work in a military factory. White learned a lot about firearms from him and also learned from him those nearby herdsmen had ammunition. The other friend was Wu Ziming, a native of Xinjiang who had been imprisoned for theft. He greatly admired White and always believed that White was someone who could do something big. One day in 1992, White received a letter from his 10-year-old daughter. She wrote about how her stepfather treated them badly and often beat her mother. She also mentioned that other children had pocket money, but they didn't. This made White feel very guilty, and he couldn't help but cry after reading the letter. He talked to his fellow inmate Li Qingliang about it, and Li advised him to behave well and try to get out of prison sooner. White said he was determined to get 3 million RMB, about $540,000 when he got out. He wanted to use the money to buy houses for his two children and give them a better life. In 1993, at the age of 35, White's good behavior in prison earned him a one-year reduction in his sentence. One day, some of the shepherd's sheep accidentally wandered onto prison property. White took possession of the sheep, and when the shepherds came looking for the sheep, White demanded compensation, claiming the sheep had damaged their vegetables. The shepherds said they had no money, so White suggested they trade for something. After some negotiation, they agreed to exchange bullets. As a result, White received 95 rifle and pistol bullets, which he carefully wrapped and hid on the roof of the cowshed. Two other free prisoners were Li Baoyu, imprisoned for theft, and Fu Keijun, imprisoned for robbing a taxi. Both, like White, were from Beijing and a few years younger than him. The three of them lived together in the house near the cowshed. They often roamed the nearby city of Shihezi, sometimes visiting prostitutes and occasionally staying out all night. But as long as they weren't caught by the prison guards, they wouldn't be punished. Li Baoyu was the leader of the three, very bossy, and Fu Keijun came from a wealthy family and had a bad temper. White, on the other hand, 
came from a humble background, was reserved, and was often insulted by the other two. He was also often assigned to dirty and tiring work, such as cleaning up cow dung. When White expressed his dissatisfaction, he was met with physical aggression from the other two. Despite this, White didn't fight back, which led them to believe he was weak. As a result, they treated him even worse. White endured it all, silently storing up his resentment. In September 1993, while the three of them were hurting, Li Baoyu tried to assert his authority over White. When White ignored him, Li got angry and started insulting White and even threw a few punches at him. White didn't fight back, but instead he gave Li a fierce look. At that moment, White decided that he had had enough. He was determined to make the people who bullied him disappear. A few days later, Fu Keijin went out to have some fun, leaving only White and Li behind. White took the initiative to find Li in the house and told him that he had hidden 200 yuan, about $35, in a crack in the wall of the cow shed and couldn't get it back. He said that if Li could get it back, he would take him out for a drink. Li found a piece of wire and crouched down to retrieve the money while continuing to curse at White. At that moment, White took a hammer he had hidden in his clothes and hit Li on the head. After confirming that Li was dead, White carried him to a pre-dug hole near the cow shed, dropped him in, filled the hole, and cleaned up the scene. After White calmly carried out his first murder, he continued with his normal routine of working, eating, and sleeping. The next night, Fu Keijun asked White why Li hadn't returned, and although he found it strange, he didn't think much of it. It wasn't until two days later that White voluntarily told the prison guards that Li had not returned. The prison authorities began an investigation, thinking that since Lee was scheduled to be released in a year, he wouldn't have any reason to escape. But a week passed with no news, and no irregularities were found on or off the farm. Despite suspicions about White, there was no evidence, and the case was eventually closed as Lee's escape. After the incident, only Fu Keijun and White remained free prisoners. Fu and some of his fellow prisoners suspected that Li's disappearance was unusual and might be related to White. As a result, Fu's attitude toward White softened, and they coexisted peacefully for six months. In White's mind, however, he vividly remembered the insults and beatings he had received from Fu in the past. Late on the night of March 20, 1994, Fu was sleeping soundly in the house. White quietly took out a hammer approached Fu and struck him. Fu awoke and struggled, but White continued to beat him, staining the bedding and pillow with blood and splattering it on the wall. White then buried Fu in a hole he had dug the day before near the cow shed, took the bedding and pillow outside to burn, buried the ashes, and finally cleaned up the scene in the house. Two days later, White reported to the prison guards that Fu had not returned from a night out. This time, the prison authorities took it seriously. They suspected White and searched the farm thoroughly. They found 700 RMB hidden under Fu's bed and wondered why he didn't take the money with him if he had escaped. The guards also found bloodstains on the wall of the house. After testing, they confirmed that the blood type matched Fu's. In addition, someone reported seeing White burning something on the morning of March 22nd and bullets were found hidden on the roof of the cow shed. Linking these events to Li Baoyu's disappearance, the guards arrested White and took him back to the prison. After a week of questioning, White still refused to admit to burning anything. He said the bloodstains on the wall might have been from an earlier fight between Li and Fu. White did admit to hiding the bullets and suggested that Fu often visited prostitutes, suggesting that something might have happened to him. The prison couldn't prove Fu was dead, because they never found his body. Without evidence, they couldn't convict White. After spending 125 days in solitary confinement, White wrote a pledge and was released as a free prisoner. After completing his second revenge, White behaved well in prison, and his earlier one-year sentence reduction remained in effect. Shortly thereafter, White again obtained 75 rifle bullets and 50 pistol bullets from a shepherd, buried them outside the farm, and made a mark to remember where they were. 
On March 7, 1996, a 38-year-old white was released a year early. Before leaving, he carefully concealed the bullets in his clothes and boarded the long train back to Beijing. On March 12, 1996, after a long 70-hour train ride, the 38-year-old white finally returned to Beijing, armed with his release certificate and bullets. Before going to prison, White had a house in Beijing where he lived with his wife and twins. After his wife divorced him, his younger brother's family moved in. When he first returned to Beijing, White stayed with his mother and stepfather in their apartment in the Shijingshan district. A month later, he rented a small place on his own. His whole family was happy to have him back, and White finally felt the warmth he had missed for so long. A few days later, White went to the police station to apply for an ID. He presented his release certificate, but the police gave him a hard time and said it would take at least six months. White felt that the police were mistreating him and questioned the police. This led to an argument, and the police angrily told him that his ID would take two years to process. Later, the police told him that his paperwork was incomplete. Each time White brought new documents, the police still claimed they were insufficient. After many attempts, White felt that the police were discriminating against him because he used to be a criminal. White's mother suggested that he give the police a gift, but White angrily said, what can I give? I have trouble even putting food on the table. They are deliberately making it hard for me to live. Without an ID card, White couldn't get a job and began to resent the police. He then spent over 100 RMB, about $12, to buy some razors and set up a stall to sell them on several well-known streets in Beijing. But his goods were confiscated, and he was fined several times by urban management officials, adding to White's frustration. In China, the Urban Management Enforcement Department is a unique entity whose primary role is to maintain the city's image. However, they often resort to harsh measures when dealing with the lower classes, leading to considerable controversy and a bad reputation in Chinese society. While in prison, White promised himself that if he got a job and was treated with respect upon his release, he would live a normal life. If not, he would take revenge on society. Now he has a goal of getting 3 million RMB and plans to do it through robbery. The first step in the plan was to obtain a weapon. On the 19th day after his return to Beijing, the evening of March 31, 1996, White went to the Gaojing Thermal Power Plant in Shijingshan District. He had visited the area several times before and knew that the guard at the plant gate was armed. He waited in the shadows and, at 9.40 p.m., attacked the guard with an iron rod when the guard wasn't paying attention. The guard fell unconscious, and White took an unloaded Type 56 semi-automatic rifle and ran away. He then buried the rifle on a nearby hill and went home to sleep. When the police arrived and found the guard injured and his rifle missing, they took the case very seriously, even though they didn't find many clues at the scene. White was not satisfied with a rifle. He wanted a handgun as well. A week later, on April 7, 1996, he went to the area near the Beijing Military District Armored Forces Command. He waited for several hours in a small grove across from the main gate, watching the guards. At 11.15 p.m., White used the rifle he had stolen earlier to shoot and wound a guard. The wounded guard ran back to the duty room, and since White didn't get what he wanted, he left immediately. Several soldiers rushed out, but they didn't find where White was hiding. After escaping, White flagged down an unlicensed rental van on the road. When the driver asked what was in the bag, he claimed it was wood planks for remodeling. They agreed on a price, and the driver agreed to take him to the 337 bus terminal. By this time, however, a nearby police patrol car had received information about the shooting and stopped the van for questioning. Thinking the police had found him, White quickly got out of the van and fired at the officers as they approached, wounding four of the six officers. Some officers returned fire, but White managed to escape unharmed. He later ran into a nearby wooded area, hid the gun, 
and even took a nap. At daybreak, he pretended to go for a morning jog and returned home. Even when the police stopped him for questioning, they didn't suspect him. Based on their investigation of the crime scene, the police determined that the bullets used to shoot the guard and the officers were both 7.62 millimeter, model 7581. Ballistic analysis concluded that the gun used in the shootings matched the Type 56 semi-automatic rifle that had gone missing from the guard on March 31st. Footprints of the suspect were also found at the scene, leading to the conclusion that the suspect acted alone, was between 30 and 40 years old, in excellent physical condition, and approximately 1.8 meters tall. The van driver also provided information to the police, stating that the suspect had a Beijing accent and was headed to the 337 bus terminal, which happens to be near White's mother's house. Acting on this tip, the police conducted door-to-door -door searches of residents within a five-kilometer radius of the bus terminal. During the investigation, police met with White at his mother's residence, but found nothing unusual and took only routine notes. White did not give up on his goal of obtaining a handgun. This time, he set his sights on the Beijing military shooting range. After scouting the area, he noticed that the guards wore holsters and magazine pouches. On April 21, 1996, White retrieved the rifle he had hidden in a small grove, then hid in a cornfield near the range and waited for several hours. At about 1.30 a.m., he shot and killed a guard from a distance of 10 meters. White rushed to grab the guard's holster and magazine pouch, but soon discovered they were empty. Disappointed and angry, he threw the holster and pouch into the grass as he fled. After running for hours, White hid the rifle in a nearby mountain again and returned home. In the 1990s, many guards carried empty holsters, but White was unaware of this. An innocent guard became the third victim to lose his life. In the three weeks from March 31st to April 22nd, there were three shootings in Beijing, all of which targeted sentries. The bullets used in all three cases had the same code, 7581. The police formed a special task force to investigate. Many police believed that the suspect was likely a retired military man motivated by dissatisfaction with society and revenge against the military. Around the same time, several violent bank robberies involving firearms occurred in China. As a result, a second strike hard anti-crime campaign began in April 1996, focusing primarily on a nationwide gun control operation. In the months that followed, the military in Beijing provided real guns to all the guards, and the police also received bulletproof vests. There were frequent patrols of police cars in the streets to prevent another shooting. This extensive and constant surveillance made it impossible for White to strike again. He chose to wait quietly for an opportunity. During this time, White's younger sister-in-law introduced him to a woman named Xie Zongfen. From rural Sichuan, Xi is a year older than White. She is divorced and has two children. She runs a small business in Beijing and was looking for a man with Beijing residency. She was okay with White's past prison time. Xi was caring and attentive to White and took good care of him. They quickly confirmed their relationship and soon Xi moved in with White. White's mother was thrilled that he had found a girlfriend and the whole family hoped that he would soon settle down and get married. However, after a few weeks of happy times, Z began to notice White's bad temper. He often left the house for long periods without explanation, and even didn't come home for several days in a month. Z began to feel that White was hiding something from her. White, who hadn't been home for a few days, was actually looking for a new target. Since he couldn't find an opportunity in Beijing, he remembered that there was a military barracks in Sushui, Baoding City, where he grew up. He noticed that the guards there carried Type 81 automatic rifles, which were better than his Type 56 semi-automatic rifle. He also studied the area around the barracks and planned an escape route. On July 24, 1996, three months after his last crime, White took a bus from Beijing to Sushui, a two-hour drive carrying a rifle. 
He then buried the rifle in an orchard near the barracks and returned to Beijing. Two days later, on July 26th, White made his third trip to Sushui. He hid in the fields near the barracks and, beginning in the afternoon, slowly approached his target. After several hours, he reached a spot in the grass about 10 meters from the guard, where he lay still for four hours, waiting for the right moment. At midnight, White pulled out his rifle and took aim like a sniper. At 1 a.m., he began firing continuously. Two of the three guards on duty were killed instantly, while one was wounded and ran back to the barracks. White quickly rushed up, grabbed an 81 automatic rifle from the shoulder of a fallen guard, and fled the scene. The soldiers in the barracks immediately ran out of the gate, but no one found White. The army immediately organized a large number of soldiers to search the nearby streets, questioning passers-by and vehicles. After running for several hours, White arrived at an abandoned brick kiln. He buried two rifles and some bullets nearby, changed clothes, and took a short nap. At 8 a.m., he flagged down a long-distance bus heading back to Beijing. Shortly after boarding, the bus was stopped for inspection. White calmly asked the soldier what was going on, and the soldier informed him that their barracks had been robbed. After questioning each passenger and inspecting their belongings, the soldier found nothing unusual and allowed the bus to continue. White was able to return to his home in Beijing without any problems. On July 27th, Beijing police arrived at the Sushui barracks to collect more footprints and bullet casings. They soon discovered that the bullets had the same serial number, leading them to conclude that the same suspect was involved in the three shootings in Beijing. A special task force was set up to investigate the source and distribution of the bullets. After successfully carrying out his plan, White took some time to rest. He hadn't given up on getting a handgun, so he suggested to Z that they visit her hometown in Sichuan to meet her parents. Z cried and protested, not wanting to go back. White insisted and told her she had to listen to him. Z then confessed that she hadn't actually divorced her husband. Z explained that many married women from rural areas who moved to the city to do business claimed to be single to make life easier. After thinking it over, White told Z that he didn't care about her past and forgave her. At the same time, he revealed to her that he had recently stolen weapons he wanted to see how Z would react. If she obeyed him, he could use her. If she wanted to leave, he would make her disappear. Facing the ruthless White, Z felt scared, but she still had feelings for him. She accepted. In early August 1996, the two arrived in Sichuan. A man told him to pay a deposit and wait six months to get a gun from Yunnan province. But White didn't believe him and returned to Beijing empty-handed. Upon his return to Beijing, White did not fully trust Si and was afraid that she might betray him. He dug a hole in the nearby mountain and prepared for the worst. One day, he took Si to a restaurant and then suggested they go hiking. Unsuspecting, Si went along, chatting and laughing with White. White had originally planned to get rid of Si on the mountain, but in the end, he couldn't bring himself to do it and they went back home together. Later, White physically assaulted and threatened Z several times, effectively controlling her mentally. In early September 1996, White and Z went to Sushui to retrieve the Type 81 automatic rifle and ammunition, while rehiding another semi-automatic rifle. With the weapons in hand, White began scouting for robbery targets. Over the next few days, he and Z visited several wholesale markets in Beijing and Hebei, pretending to be interested in renting a shop to start a business. They asked the merchants about their daily sales and learned that they made less than 20,000 RMB per day, about $2,400. Unsatisfied with the amount, White decided to abandon the idea. At the same time, another daring criminal was arrested in Beijing for armed robbery of an armored car. All the banks in Beijing were also tightening security. This made White even more certain that he wouldn't rob a bank or an armored car. In early December, White found a tobacco market in Deshengmen, Beijing, where two businesses were making up to 500,000 RMB, 
about $60,000, a day. On December 16th, dressed in a dark overcoat and carrying a concealed rifle, White planned to rob one of the two shops. However, one of the businesses was closed that day, and the other, which normally dealt only in cash, had switched to accepting checks. This forced White to abandon his plan. At 12.20 p.m., as he was about to leave, he noticed another merchant nearby finishing a transaction and counting money. White then pulled a stocking over his head and rushed to grab the woman's bag. She resisted, and in response, White fired his gun, hitting the woman in the chest and taking the bag. As bystanders called for help, White fired several shots at passersby, wounding three male employees of nearby businesses. White then fled to a nearby garbage dump and buried the money, the gun, and the stolen bag in various corners of the dump. He then calmly rode his bicycle to a nearby market, bought some wholesale socks, and returned home to give them to Z. Two days later, White retrieved the money and gave it to Z. After counting, she found a total of 65,000 RMB, about $7,800. At first, Z said she wouldn't use the money because it was tainted with blood, but she ended up spending it. The police investigation revealed that the bullets used in this latest crime were the same type as those used in the previous three shootings and were identified as coming from a Type 81 automatic rifle, which matched the weapon robbed in Zushui. This led the police to conclude that the perpetrator's intention was not to retaliate against the military, but rather to obtain the weapon for the purpose of committing robberies. They also ruled out the possibility that the suspect was a retired military man. Police investigating the source of the bullets found that this type of ammunition was produced in the 1970s during the Cultural Revolution. It was mainly distributed to the Nanjing military region and the Lanzhou military region. The Nanjing military region confirmed that it had never distributed this batch of bullets. The Lanzhou military region, which is responsible for the northwestern region of China, stated that all of these bullets were sent to Xinjiang. The special task force then traveled to Xinjiang to continue its investigation. They soon learned that the sheer quantity and wide distribution of the bullets, as well as the length of time they had been distributed, made tracing them very difficult. However, they discovered that in addition to the military, some local herders had access to this batch of bullets. After the successful robbery, White's desire for money grew even stronger, and he wanted to commit another crime. However, at that time, the Beijing police increased their presence with patrols and security at every market. White didn't dare to do anything reckless. Soon, the 1997 Chinese New Year arrived, and White bought gifts for his family. The whole family finally celebrated the New Year together after such a very long time. From his return to Beijing on March 12th, 1996, until the end of the year, White attacked the military four times, killing three guards, and robbed a market, resulting in one death, for a total of four deaths and nine injuries. White was still far from the three million RMB he wanted. He thought of Xinjiang, where many people were involved in the cotton trade. He asked Zi to lie to his mother and say they were going back to Zi's hometown for a while. On February 21, 1997, White and Zi boarded a train together to Xinjiang. Before leaving for Xinjiang, White gave his younger brother $6,000 of the $7,800 he robbed for safekeeping, claiming it was money he had recently earned and could be used for their mother's medical expenses. Later, White hid a rifle and ammunition in his coat and managed to sneak into the train station which at the time checked luggage but not personal clothing. On May 13, 1997, White and Z arrived in Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang, and immediately took a long-distance bus to Shaihezi, the area where White had served his sentence. His purpose in coming here was to stock up on ammunition, only to find upon arrival that the ammunition depot had been moved over a year ago. Xinjiang is China's largest province, accounting for 16% of the country's total area. It shares borders with eight countries, 
including Russia, Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. It became the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in 1955, with the Uyghur ethnic group making up 73% of the population. The government launched a major development plan for the Western region, resulting in an influx of Han Chinese from other parts of China, and the use of military forces for development work. To solve the marriage problems of male soldiers, many women were recruited from mainland to join the military, work, and settle in Xinjiang. This led to the formation of many military groups in Xinjiang. And as a result, the proportion of Han Chinese in the region continued to grow. In the 1990s, about one million migrant workers were recruited each year from mainland China to come to Xinjiang for the cotton harvest. White and Zi traveled several more hours to Shihezi and found White's former prison friend, Wu Ziming. Wu had been living with his parents after his release from prison. White told Wu that he had come to Xinjiang to do cotton business and needed some cotton money. Wu understood his meaning, and the next day he quit his job and joined White. He also moved out of his house and began living with White and Zi. Wu asked White how he managed to quit smoking and drinking. White explained that drinking clouds one's judgment, and smoking can leave incriminating evidence. He had seen real criminal cases where the perpetrators were caught because they left cigarette butts at the scene, so he had to be careful. After hearing this, Wu also quit smoking. For the next few days, White and Wu visited the cotton markets near Shihezi every day to gather information. Since it was the slow season for cotton trading, the merchants didn't have much cash on hand. After assessing the situation, White planned to wait for the right time to raid several markets in a row. He told Wu that they couldn't rush things, and that they had to be absolutely sure before they acted, even if it took a few months. At this point, White also admitted to Wu that he had a rifle, but they needed another one before they could proceed. In May 1996, the two arrived at an armed police camp near Shihezi, with plans to rob the guard again. Just as White was about to act, a soldier appeared and warned the guard to be on high alert because two prisoners had escaped from a nearby jail. This forced White to abandon his plan. In late May, while gathering information about the cotton markets in the nearby town of Kuitun, they noticed that the guard at a nearby military training center had the same Type 81 automatic rifles as White. On the evening of June 5th, White tried to sneak into the camp to steal a rifle, but was spotted by a soldier. They fled in panic, and the military assumed he was just a common thief and didn't report the incident. That night, as they walked through the Gobi Desert, they came across a police car. The police found the two men suspicious, stopped to question them, and insisted on searching their bags. While Wu was talking to the police, White pulled out his rifle and fired a shot into the air. The unarmed police immediately got into their car and drove away. When they returned, they reported to the police chief, and the next day, more than a dozen officers searched the Gobi Desert for hours, but couldn't find any bullet casings. There were no bullet marks on the police car, and none of the officers on duty were injured. Some people doubted the veracity of the officer's story, thinking that this policeman might have made it up to get credit as a result, the matter was dropped. To avoid being chased by the military and police, White and Wu decided to flee on foot. They walked for more than 20 hours through Gobi Desert, then took a bus back to their residence. After that, they continued to scout the cotton markets, arsenals, and military camps. On July 5, 1997, after six scouting trips, White and Wu arrived at the 140 and 1st Division Armory near the former prison where White had served time. At 6 p.m., White pried open the unguarded gate, entered, and shot and killed two large guard dogs. They found no weapons in the armory, only some old communications equipment, so they fled empty-handed. Early the next morning, at 4 a.m., the fleeing duo encountered a passerby on a nearby dune. To silence him, White shot the man. It was the first time Wu had seen White commit murder. The two then buried the innocent man in the Gobi Desert. After the police investigated the scene, they found that nothing was missing. 
They also discovered that the shell casings were of the 7581 model, indicating that a military-style firearm was used. Nearby farmers reported seeing two suspects, and based on footprints collected, estimated their heights to be approximately 1.75 meters and 1.7 meters. During a police meeting to analyze the suspect's motives, some officers suggested that it might not be a big deal, possibly just locals stealing dogs for food. Another officer asked why a gun was used, to which the answer was that many people in the area have guns, so it's not unusual. The meeting didn't reach a conclusion about the suspect's motives, but because of the use of firearms, it was considered a serious matter. At that moment, a police officer received a call reporting that a small motel had found bullets under a bed while cleaning a room. The police immediately went to the hotel and found a package of bullets in the luggage of a guest. The hotel staff mentioned that a man and a woman were in the room. Plainclothes police officers quickly disguised themselves inside and outside the motel and waited for the suspects to return. With the help of the hotel staff, several suspects were detained on the spot. After questioning, it was determined that they had come to the area to obtain firearms with the intention of robbing a bank and that they had no connection to White Case. Dee spends her days doing nothing at home, often chatting with neighbors. One day, while talking to her neighbor's daughter, she learned that the young woman worked as a Russian translator at the Border Hotel in Urumqi. She mentioned that business was booming there with very wealthy merchants carrying millions of RMB in cash in sacks. The Border Hotel used to be a military facility, but since 1993 it has become the largest international trade market in Xinjiang, with more than 600 shops specializing in clothing, home appliances, and food. The main customers are from Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and other countries. Goods are shipped directly from Xinjiang's ports to these countries. In addition, foreign merchants bring products from their own countries to sell in this market, accepting large amounts of RMB, and then converting them into US dollars or other currencies to take back home. As a result, the Border Hotel sees many Chinese and foreign individuals carrying large amounts of cash into the market for trading or currency exchange outside the market building on a daily basis. Shortly, White and Z stayed in Urumqi for two days and visited the border hotel. White noticed that there were indeed many people making large cash transactions there, much more than at the cotton market he had visited earlier. He decided to give up on the cotton market. The next important thing was to get another gun. Wu complained to White, Can we ride motorcycles for the next robbery? Walking is too tiring. White replied, Riding motorcycles makes us too conspicuous. If we ride, it should be somebody else's. On July 29, 1997, the two hid in the grass on the side of the road and prepared to rob passers-by. Wu stopped a motorcycle and pretended to hitch a ride, but White suddenly appeared and shot the motorcyclist. They then buried the motorcyclist in the nearby grass. The motorcyclist was a local farmer. After searching for a while, they decided to target a police officer in a nearby suburb for their robbery. On the afternoon of August 7, 1997, they arrived near the police station on a stolen motorcycle and waited. In the early morning hours, White and Wu broke into the police officer's dormitory and fired shots, killing Officer Jiang and another guard instantly. White took Officer Jiang's Type 54 pistol and some ammunition before quickly fleeing on the motorcycle. The entire crime took less than a minute. After more than 10 hours, two police officers were found dead in the dormitory. They had been shot without warning, and the bullet casings found at the scene matched the bullets used to shoot dogs at the armory a month earlier. This prompted the police to conduct an extensive weapons search in and around Shaihezi. The killing of the two policemen and the theft of the pistol caused great anger among the local police and the people and Officer Zhang's colleagues vowed to catch the killer. The Shihezi police soon learned that there had been several shootings in Beijing, using bullets with the same model number, 7581, but they were unable to reach the Beijing police by phone. 
Four days after killing the policemen, White and Wu pushed the stolen motorcycle into the river on the outskirts. Tai expressed a desire to return to her hometown to see her children and parents, but White refused. On August 14, 1997, White and Wu arrived at the Border Hotel in Urumqi to make preparations. White mapped out their entry and exit routes, then dug a pit in a nearby wood, and the two men returned to Shihizi later that day. The Border Hotel is located on Yan'an Road in Urumqi, right next to Xinjiang University. The university campus is quite large, with teaching buildings, dormitories, residential areas, farms, a lake, a hill, and an affiliated high school. The back gate of the high school leads to a grove behind Xinjiang University, not far from the Border Hotel. There is a gap in the wall between them that hasn't been repaired in many years making it convenient for locals to come and go, but posing an ongoing security risk. The pit white dug is in the grove behind the Xinjiang University affiliated high school. On the afternoon of August 18, 1997, White and Wu returned to Border Hotel and hid their guns in a pit they had dug earlier. They then checked into a small motel. The next morning, August 19, White, carrying a large bag containing a rifle, and Wu walked around the square in front of the border hotel, looking for potential targets. They soon spotted two Uyghurs in a corner, preparing to exchange a large amount of cash. White handed the pistol to Wu, took the rifle from the bag, and began to rob them of the money. When the Uyghur refused to comply, White immediately fired. He then threw a bag at Wu and went after the other Uyghur. The shooting caused chaos, and as they ran, White shot anyone who tried to stop him. Eventually, they arrived at the gate of the Xinjiang University affiliated high school. Some people chased them, but without weapons, they didn't dare get too close. The school was on summer vacation, but some boys were playing basketball on campus. They saw the suspicious people and heard someone yell from behind. Catch them, they are criminals. Unaware of the danger, some of the boys ran after them. White reached the back gate of the school and fired again, killing two 17-year-old students. Then they ran to the grove behind the wall and buried the weapons and money in the pit they had dug. They changed clothes and fled in another direction. The police had not yet arrived, and those without weapons did not dare to pursue them. The entire crime and escape lasted less than 20 minutes. They fired a total of 14 shots, killing seven people and injuring five others. The two bags contain a total of 1.4 million RMB and about 170,000 US dollars, both in RMB and US dollars. The shooting sent shockwaves through Urumqi and across the country. Police quickly cordoned off the area and soon identified the bullet casings at the scene as 7581. They then conducted a thorough search of the border hotel and the surrounding area. The military also took action blocking the city's main roads, and setting up more than a dozen checkpoints to inspect all vehicles in an effort to track down individuals carrying firearms and bags. Police sniffer dogs ran to the small grove behind the school, but got lost, then ran to another market and lost the scent. Police and military commanders watched and directed the operation from the hill at Xinjiang University, but they couldn't figure out how the perpetrators had escaped. Unknown to everyone, after escaping from the small grove behind the school, White and Wu walked out of another gate at Xinjiang University and made their way to an amusement park 1.5 kilometers away, where they rode the Ferris wheel. After leaving the amusement park, the two took a bus back to Shihezi. After the successful robbery, Wu was very excited and asked White several times a day when they were going to pick up the money, which annoyed White. White believed that Wu wanted half of the money, but he hadn't been very helpful. Wu hadn't even fired a single shot. In addition, Wu was careless, and having the money would draw attention to himself and risk being reported, which would put him in danger. Unable to resist Wu's nagging, three days later, on August 22nd, White and Wu returned to Urumqi, went to the small grove, confirmed that the money was still there, and White took out the pistol to carry with him. They returned the same day. 
The next day, White suggested to Wu that they couldn't spend the money in Xinjiang, so they should get the money out, and then return to Beijing to split it. Wu was both eager and a little worried. White said, We've been working hard for so long, it's time to relax a bit. Let's go to Tianxi and Urumqi first, and then go to Beijing. On August 26, 1997, White, Zi, and Wu went to the Tianxi scenic area. The three of them walked happily up the mountain. After walking for two hours and reaching a place where no one was around, they sat on the mountainside to rest. Suddenly, while Wu was drinking water, White took out a hammer hidden in his clothes and tried to hit Wu, but the injury was not serious. Wu got scared and ran down the mountain, and White, unable to catch up, quickly pulled out pistol and fired. After killing Wu, White poured gasoline on Wu's face and set it on fire. Zi, who witnessed White kill someone for the first time, was petrified. White promised Zi that he wouldn't harm her and urged her to quickly bury Wu's belongings and the tools used in the crime. The next day, White and Zi returned to Urumqi from Tianqi and retrieved the money from the small grove at Xinjiang University. They then hid $170,000 in vests. White left the rifle in Xinjiang and carried the pistol. They boarded a train back to Beijing that same day. On August 31, 1997, White and Zi returned to Beijing. On the same day, Wu's body was discovered. This time, White didn't hide the gun and money outside, but brought them back to their residence. White then went to his mother's house and gave her 10,000 RMB about one two hundred dollars, saying he had earned it in the cotton business in Xinjiang. His mother took the money, feeling a little uneasy, but didn't ask any questions. White took a shower, changed into clean clothes, and then went out with Zi to spend some happy time. Zi expressed her desire to return to her hometown to see her children, and White agreed. He gave Zi 110,000 RMB, about $13,000, and told her to spend it as she wished, but not to deposit it in the bank. On September 2nd, White saw Z off at the airport. After she left, White felt deep regret for letting her go. He had thought about getting rid of Z, and had tried to provoke her several times, but Z's compliant nature had prevented him from doing so. At the same time, police in Xinjiang linked the Urumqi and Shihezi cases by bullet numbers identifying them as the work of the same perpetrator. They also found that the military in Beijing and Hebei province had lost firearms. When they compared the bullets from the Beijing case, they found a match, linking the Xinjiang, Beijing, and Hebei cases for further investigation. Based on eyewitness descriptions, the police drew two sketches of the suspects and asked the public for information. Police found a bag and other items left by White at the border hotel in Xinjiang. After an extensive search, they found the person who had sewn the bag and learned that one suspect had a Xinjiang accent, while the other had a Beijing accent. They also discovered that the bullet found in Wu's body in Tianqi matched the type of bullet found in the border hotel. But due to facial burns, Wu's identity could not be confirmed. During the investigation, Police in Shihezi met with Wu's parents, who mentioned that their son had friends visited from Beijing a few months earlier, but they did not know the man's identity. Xinjiang police repeatedly suspected that White was the person they were looking for by checking the Shihezi prison roster. However, White's height of 1.8 meters conflicted with the 1.75 meters, estimated by Beijing police through footprint analysis. In fact, it's because White's feet are relatively small for his height. On September 5, 1997, the Beijing police received a telegram from the Shihezi police in Xinjiang. At 7 p.m. that evening, White was at his mother's house watching television when there was a knock at the door. Because of the hot weather, White went to answer the door wearing only his shorts. When he opened the door, he saw four police officers standing outside. One of the officers, who had seen White before, said to him, Your ID is ready. Come with us to the police station to fill out some forms. White asked, Do I have to go now? The officer replied, Yes, right now. 
White understood the situation immediately. He said, Okay, let me get dressed. Just as he was about to get his gun, his mother came out of the bedroom to greet the police. White knew that if he used the gun, it would scare his mother, and there would probably be more police outside. So he decided not to resist and told his mother, My ID is ready. I'll be back after I finish some paperwork. As soon as he stepped outside, the police arrested him. When White was first arrested, his immediate reaction was that Z had betrayed him. He didn't have a chance to worry about Z because she was also arrested in her hometown of Sichuan. He soon learned that it was Wu who had led to his quick arrest. Before going to Tianxi with White, Wu was afraid that White would silence him. So he wrote down White's and Xi's names and addresses and gave them to his brother. Wu told his brother that if he didn't hear from him for more than a month, he should take the note and report it to the police. Wu's brother didn't know anything about the robbery and didn't realize the seriousness of the situation until he was questioned by the police because he hadn't been able to reach Wu and was worried that something had happened. So he handed over the note that Wu had left. After White was brought in, Beijing police interrogated him throughout the night. After several hours of questioning, he began to confess to all the crimes he had committed. Police later found cash and a loaded pistol at his and his mother's home. They also found two rifles, buried in a brick kiln in Sushui, Hebei, and in a small grove at Xinjiang University. In addition, they discovered the bodies of Li and Fu, who were killed near the cow shed next to Shihezi prison, and the body of a motorcyclist in the roadside grass on the outskirts of Shihezi. However, the victim killed by White in the Gobi Desert has not yet been found. Upon returning to his hometown, Z spent over $3,000 in just four days before being arrested and taken to Beijing on September 9th. On December 3rd, 1997, White and Z were taken by police to Urumqi. Three months later, on the morning of March 3rd, 1998, their case was heard by the Urumqi Intermediate People's Court in Xinjiang. White was sentenced to death for premeditated murder, armed robbery, and theft of public and private property. C was sentenced to 12 years in prison. In his final statement, White expressed remorse and apologized to the people of Xinjiang. On April 29, 1998, White was executed by firing squad in Xinjiang, ending his life of crime. On April 26, 2005, after three reductions in her sentence and seven years in prison, the 48-year-old C was released. She told reporters, I hate him for not listening to me. White had a very strong ability to avoid detection. He was good at studying people's psychological states. He knew it was risky to rob in crowded areas, but if he fired a gun, people would scatter or hide, too afraid to look at him. He was good at timing and carefully planned his entry and exit times. After committing a crime, he would remove the gun and money from him, leaving no evidence on his person. In addition, he had very strong mental resilience and excellent shooting skills. If he had participated in a war, he might have been an excellent commander. White has not always been a bad man. He once wanted to provide a good life for his children. But faced with a harsh sentence, bullying, difficulty obtaining identification, and harassment from law enforcement when selling goods, he chose a path of extreme violence that hurt innocent people. He was undoubtedly a selfish, cold-blooded, and extremely vicious criminal. None of this can serve as an excuse for taking the lives of others. After the year 2000, gun control in China became stricter. Even buying imitation guns online could lead to a police investigation. White never imagined that in Xinjiang, where he once easily used guns to commit crimes, 20 years later, not only was gun control strict, but even the knives of meat and fruit vendors had to be chained and couldn't be taken away. The two students White killed at Xinjiang University Affiliated High School were only two years older than his own children. They heard someone shout, catch the bad guy at the school and went after him. Perhaps they were thinking of the emphasis on bravery and righteousness in Chinese education. 
The person who shouted didn't dare to run after the criminal quickly, but let the students do it, and didn't even warn them that the criminal was armed. What do you think of this case? Please leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments section. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my videos, please like and subscribe to my channel.